Good morning. Welcome. Um, what a great way to start today, speaking about the view from Russia and the global science agenda. Um, my name is Mariette Di Cristina. I'm the editor-in-chief of Scientific American magazine, which actually has had a presence in Russian in uh, translated form in the past 30 years. I had a great privilege about um, a few years ago in 2011. I, I got to visit Moscow for the first time in my life, and I hope I have that pleasure again sometime. And I was really, really struck, actually, by the, the passion of the Russians that I met about their science and um, about the many contributions they've made and about the ones that they will make. And so I, I want to share that with you. Actually, what that, um, that experience did was it inspired for me a, uh, a desire to create a global view in Scientific American every year about, about science generally. So I'm, I'm very excited to hear, um, to hear about Russian science today. Um, today, our mission for this panel is to discuss how Russian science is poised to reshape the global innovation system. And we have a wonderful set of panelists around for me. Um, I hope you can bear with the, the round structure. Uh, at times, I'm going to ask for if anybody has questions, and I'll do my best to look behind me, uh, but maybe the other panelists can, can help as well. Um, I'd like to introduce them briefly to you and then hear their initial thoughts about this important question of how Russian science is, is poised to drive innovation forward. Um, straight across from me is Valerie Foken, who is professor of the University of Southern California in the United States, and you also have an appointment in, in Moscow as Institute well. Institute of Physics and Technology. Thank you. And then um, Andrei Prosenko, next to me, is an aide to the president of the Russian Federation. Artem Oganov, across from me here, is professor of Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology, also a professor at the Russian Academy of Sciences in the Russian Federation, and also a professor at Stony Brook. I'm not sure when you have time to sleep, but <laughs> I'm impressed with all of those. And I'm delighted also to have here Anton Shingarev, of Kapersky Lab, um, who will speak to us about many of the practical areas of how Russian science um, can, can help advance innovation. So I, I hope it's OK with you, Professor uh, Fresenko, if you might start us off with some of your thoughts about how Russian science is, is ready to um, help drive innovation, all the many changes that you've made. Ну, во-первых, мы всегда готовы <laughs> участвовать в изменениях. И, как мы видим даже по этому круглому столу, не только в стране, но и в мире. Очень важно, что российские ученые сегодня российскую науку можно рассматривать could be regarded Это, from two uh, perspectives. России, First of all, as it's these, this research that is done in Russia, and also research учеными, that is done by the Russian scientists around the world. То, России, uh, and so what's be, if what's being done in Russia, uh, the scale, uh, the scale of what's России, being done in Russia, uh, on, no, в какой-то степени соответствует экономике российской экономики, которая сегодня является не самой большой. Economy, right То вклад российских ученых в науку, наверное, существенно least, более. Uh, Самые крупные установки, которые делаются в мире, это установки в значительной степени используют российской науки. Uh, that, that are done in the world. They draw on the Russian science. If we only could think of uh, different colliders, the idea of the colliders really belongs to the Russian scientists. We can remember one of the latest installations, the Mega Science. It's the laser. 
also I Russian scientists who have done this. Maybe my colleagues could say more on that topic because they represent the Russian world to, to the global science. But I should uh, mention that in Russia today, the contribution of our scientists only keeps growing. What's important is that in the last, last 10 years in Russia, we have uh, an increased proportion of the young yeah. Russian scientists. And here the number of young scientists under 40 years old. Uh, for them, the new infrastructure is being put up. And the equipment uh, in Russia right now has increased uh, uh, that is less than five years. So, Infrastructure is extremely important, so we will definitely continue this conversation. But today we're not just the equal player in the world, but we're aspiring to be the leader in this domain. Thank you. I, I think that uh, it seems like a, a good idea to um, to have a little bit of context for, you know, being um, you know moving forward as a leading player in the world. Um, Artem, you and I were speaking yesterday about the great history of, of Russian science, and I, I think that context might be nice to hear about here. Uh, yes. Um, I think Russians are uh, very good, uh, let's say, second players. Russians easily catch up and become leaders where they were not present before. Um, I would even start from the foundation of Russia, actually, because uh, Russia started when they imported Vikings. They invited Vikings from abroad. Russians who were never present, for example, on uh, sea became first-class pirates in the beginning of their history. And then Russians who never had a centralized state got a centralized state borrowed from Vikings. And they went on to become the largest uh, country in, the hist in human history. And that is quite an achievement, I think. And uh, then for many centuries, Russia did not uh, have its own science until the beginning of the 18th century when Peter the Great imported, once again, uh, top-level academics from uh, Europe, mostly Germany. That's the creation of Russian Academy of Sciences. And uh, it took only about a century or so uh, until uh, Russia produced uh, top-level uh, own scientists. Actually, less than a century, about half a century. Um, let me remind you that Leonard Euler, probably the greatest mathematician of all times, uh, he worked most of his career in Russia. And uh, let me remind you that uh, the greatest uh, discovery in chemical science that will ever be made was made by Mendeleev, a native Russian. Uh, so this uh, habit of Russians importing some good stuff from abroad and then developing it to perfection is something, I think, innate to Russian mentality, Russian culture. Um, it's not just copying. It's really perfecting and bringing things to their logical uh, limit. I would say that Russians are actually, as far as I understand, invented brain drain. So when Peter the Great systematically imported um, top brains from Europe, that was the first, uh, the first uh, case of brain drain in human history, as far as I know, which was then even enhanced by Catherine the Great, who imported these people on a really, really large scale. By the way, maybe you have heard of this, that in the year 1796, Russian army, well, it's not exactly science, Russian army declined an application from one young French lieutenant who wanted to be a captain in the Russian army. His name was Napoleon. <laughs> so you can see the extent of uh, brain drain and not only talent brain that Russia had in the 18th century. And then Russia became a prime victim of brain drain having lost the majority of its top-level scientists, and now it's trying to regain that lost talent, and I think it's doing it uh, rather successfully, although we're just in the beginning. I, I think you've hit on a really important point, which is how, how collaborative international science is by its nature. Uh, sometimes the drain is flowing in your direction, sometimes it's not flowing in your direction, and part of how we make science succeed wherever we are is, is what we do to foster it. And you know, on that, that international uh, piece, or my, my minds with you, because you're currently working uh, in, in Southern California and yet have many collaborations across. Maybe you could speak to those a bit. 
Uh, that's one thing about the science which has always been true, and I'm not going to tell you any secrets if I say that. Uh, even in the toughest times in the 50s, 60s, uh, 70s, uh, uh, science and cultural exchanges was the channel which always remained open and which always was sustained between the East and the West of whatever countries were involved. I'm not even talking about specifically about Russia or Soviet Union at that time and the United States. But, uh, so, in today's world, science is global and international by definition as well, not only because scientists are exchanging ideas, but because we are facing the same problems. The issues of uh, not, not bacterial viral infections, the issues of the feedstock, mm -hmm. they don't have borders, so that not, not, not they cross the borders and not the same thing when we are talking about energy, when we are talking about pollution. Those are global problems which we are trying to address in all countries <coughs> in different ways. And what used to be and to some extent still remains, of course, the question of national security and national identity it does apply to science, but in reality, we are at the age where it's human identity and our security as a humanity on this planet where we need to work together. And science is a prime example, I think, of that. So yes, I do have a lab. My main appointment is at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. A few years ago, I started a laboratory at Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology at the same time when Artem started his lab there. Uh, not, not working under the, with the support of the so-called mega grant program, uh, which was a significant investment for about three years by the Ministry of Science and Education and the Russian government. It's, uh, those initiatives are limited, but there are obviously some very successful examples. Some of them don't pan out. But uh, in today's world, it's much easier to collaborate. It's much easier to communicate, and it's uh, just a second nature. This time, when you hear that somebody is working between the continents, it doesn't cause, uh, no, well, no, 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 eyes wide open and raised eyebrows that this is probably not the most effective, efficient way of doing things. In fact, it is, and we can capitalize on both ends, but whether it's on the human capital, whether it's on the infrastructure, and training young scientists from around the world, I think, is the responsibility of a faculty of the professors of the industrial collaborators as well, because we need to think about them more uh, as, well, now they are indeed our future, and uh, I'm, I'm by no means an old person, but still, it's, uh, I'm thinking about the 15, 17, 20-year-olds, the ones who will be uh, doing the science and moving us forward uh, in, in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So you've raised a number of really good practical issues, is that the, the world's problems don't have borders, mm -hmm. and yet we have a lot of pride in, you know, perhaps the things we're doing in our, in our own home nations. And that, that, that brings me to you for the perspective on, you know, sort of how science can help us with some of our practical issues. Could you speak to that? Yeah. Um, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm not, not smart enough to become a scientist. So I'll talk about more practical aspects uh, of uh, of closeness to, to Russian scientists. Uh, our company is 20 years old this year. Uh, we've been successful for the last 10 years globally, mostly Europe and United States, and the main reason of our success is that we have access to brilliant, most talented software engineers uh, who live in Russia. So our R&D is still in Russia, and we don't have any reasons to move it. Uh, because Russian software engineers are one of the best, and the reason why they are one of the best, it, this is 300 years of uh, traditions, traditions of mathematical education. Mm -hmm. So for IT, for software engineering, uh, math is a basic subject. And uh, in Russia you can find thousands of really talented uh, mathematicians who later can become so software developers. And this is our main competitive advantage. Uh, it's not easy to be the company with the Russian origins to fight on a global market and to fight on a very high competitive global market, which is IT and cybersecurity. And as I said, the main reason is access to unique engineers. And I completely agree there is no Russian market or US market or Israeli market. It's all international. And many, so now we can find software developers with Russian origin in many countries around the world. In Israel, it's almost half of IT sector speaks Russian. And thanks to 300 years of education. I think all of us could do with a little bit more mathematics. I, I know I, I, I was one of those people and certainly uh, still 
still value it very much. I think it would be good if we could to talk a little bit about some of the reforms. Um, we've, we've touched on mega grants, for instance, and some of the educational things. Could you talk to us about some of the, some of the things you've put into place? I will try. <laughs> First, I would like to react to what uh, Artyom has said when he said that we're the second in the game. Uh, once Herbert Karajan was asked how, what he thinks about the great violinist David Oistrakh, he said definitely he's the second uh, violin in the world. And he was asked well, who was the first. And he said, oh, there are many of them. <laughs> in this sense, uh, maybe it's not too bad uh, to be the second after all. You know, even to stay the second, but especially to be the first, we need to understand that the world is changing. And in this world, yesterday I spoke to my colleagues about this. In this world today, we have, uh, we're facing a big danger that we lose intellectual diversity. So we're very anxious about, the, about maintaining the biological diversity, but we seem to care much less about the intellectual diversity. Russian science was original in many ways, and this originality gives and used to give so much to the world. Globalization is not always good. Sometimes it diminishes the differences and sometimes it removes the individuality. So in order to maintain this individuality, we need to keep our centers of excellence and keep their specific peculiarities. And for this knowledge, for this excellence, to become something that is shared in the world, we need to build more effective communication systems. Those programs that we have today they are trying to make these Мы, things possible. Сегодня, сегодня Today, Russia is one of the biggest sponsors of creating the research infrastructure in Europe. Лет, in the last 10 years, we have invested over 1.5 billion euros into building Germany. equipment in Europe, Schweiz, in Germany, in France, in Switzerland. Your journal has published a lot on the Collider and, and not only about it. Uh, and we know just how important that is for the international community to develop this global infrastructure. So our scientists are working on all of them. And they carry this cultural code uh, in this equipment. I'm not even talking about the collider and other inventions are ideas of the Russian scientists. At the same time, what's important to us is that not only our fellow Russians uh, remain in Russia, but we also are keen to bring global minds into Russia and uh, pass their experience on to Russian young scientists. The science could not be closed. Valery said that even in the most difficult times, the exchange always remained. And it was not only done um, through publications, but also just direct communication. The Nobel laureate, uh, Jores Alferov from Russia, 
he has really received this Nobel Prize, probably because he was very successful as an intern in the United States, because he had this opportunity. So such experiences like mega grants that we're running, when we invite the scientists, we help them, we give them conditions to create when we give them money and resources and we invest money to the industry so that they could attract research institutions for R&D. And we don't always give money just to the Russian industry, but global industries, anybody who is willing to develop global science. Right now, we have major organizational restructuring in the university sector, in science. It doesn't always lead to great enthusiasm from the scientists' side. People are conservative, and scientists are also people. At the same time, we understand that today, in, in a fast-changing world, we cannot stand still. Science could not be a frozen institution in such a fast-changing world. So we are trying to keep track of that. Thank you. So, so in this first section, we've, we've heard a number of really interesting ideas, important ideas about uh, science as a global entity and Russia as a, as a country with a lot to offer and a lot uh, that's, that's going on. We talked about importing talent from abroad and, then, uh, and science from abroad and then delivering it, uh, developing it to a level of perfection, which I, I love the idea of that because science itself is always iterating. There are always questions we have that we continue to pursue. Uh, we talked about global issues having global problems and approaching them in practical ways. And we talked about um, the importance of fostering intellectual diversity, not just biodiversity, which I, I like the sound of. That globalization itself, um, while, it's, while it's good in many ways, we sometimes run the risk of losing our individual specialness. And I, I think that's an important thing to remember. Uh, for those of us who are, you know, in science, also very globally minded, but also important to be special ourselves and for our countries, that Russia is a large sponsor of research. I, I heard uh, 1.5 billion euros invested, not just in Russia, but, but elsewhere, to support labs in other countries, including Germany, including Switzerland and others. Um, and that, at the same time, we are keen to bring global minds in to Russia to exchange ideas, not only through publications, but through personal means, which I think is great as well. There's something, although it is much easier now to collaborate over long distances through digital media and other things, there is something nice about connecting personally. And that um, we, above all, in science, need to keep adapting and changing. So that, that makes me wonder if, um, I, have, I have a number of other questions that I will go into in a minute, but I thought at this point, having heard what you've heard, if anybody in the audience has a fast question or two, there are a couple of microphones around. Be happy to take them. And um, if, if you would, please, if you're asking a question, please just state your name and, and where you're from when you do it. Does anyone have a question? This one in front. So from the scientist's perspective, I guess, uh, if, you, if there was something you would say you were thankful for from the Russian government in recent initiatives, then what would you say that was a key thing for you in operating in science in Russia? And in a similar way, what would be your sort of first request if you could make a request from the uh, government today? I'd be interested to see. Um, sure, well, I can comment on it a little bit and pass it on to uh, our common <laughs> participants. <laughs> 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 yeah. but, uh, uh, Thankfully, I think uh, not, uh, not necessarily from, well, from the personal viewpoint, uh, the opportunity to try something new and different, because all scientists are driven by curiosity, obviously, above all, and uh, we'd like to try new things. And if you are truly inquisitive, truly curious, so you want to try something completely out of the box, and as was mentioned, scientists are human too, and we love our comfort zones. The current <laughs> science is really changing in a way it's converging like it started four or five hundred years ago. There was no physics 
biology, math, uh, which were separated <laughs> into the very defined disciplines, it's converging now and I think enabling that in whatever environment, whether it's in Russia or somewhere else, is an important thing uh, and is critical now because we really, when I'm seeing journals or certain uh, areas called analytical chemical biophysiology, it's, uh, I wonder whether it's necessary to uh, uh, compartmentalize modern science that much. So I think we will be successful, but in a few years I will be walking out on, of my office at the university and I wouldn't care who's, or which department people belong to, so they are just my colleagues who are working on the same problems and same issues. So that's number one. Doing it in Russia, or starting it in Russia, by no means is easy, by no means is absolutely flawless. There are many problems and many issues which we needed to overcome. But one of the key things, uh, there was a period of time, especially in the 90s, in the beginning of, uh, in the end of the 80s already as well, uh, where there were, Russian science was significantly underfunded. So there was a generation of scientists which was effectively lost. So in a way, starting from a clean slate was a little bit easier. And I think it's a very interesting experiment and I'm grateful for having that experiment. And that, that did enable a lot of people to really try their ideas without breaking anything old. Breaking is a very painful process on the personal and institutional level. So that's not, not number two uh, in there. And when you asked about requests, any initiative, especially in science and especially in high technologies, is going to be successful only if it is sustainable over a period of time. So science is, uh, or any scientific project, is like a fully loaded 747 taking off. You cannot do it on a one mile runway. You gotta have five years of consistent, continued support. You do need to have some time, yes, you need to bend arms and force our uh, uh, government officials who understand that but need to follow certain procedures and protocols to enable that sustained funding over a period of time and commitment. It needs to be willful, systematic commitment to, yes, we will see it through and no matter what happens in the next X number of years, we will support those particular projects. So I think that would be a request and we are working on that. So just as a footnote, quick footnote, I'm also uh, 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 a part of the or a president of the Russian American Scientists Association, a total non, non, not for profit, not politically affiliated organization, which is uniting scientists of Russian origin or people who speak uh, the Russian language or obtained education in Russia at some point across the world. And together as a diaspora, we are trying to help bring both the expertise, the evaluation of the peer review uh, aspects to Russia, and also to push that agenda that we need the sustained support and growth, not to survive. It needs to develop, it needs to expand, because surviving is not an option. It's just too boring and too unproductive. Hope it helps. Um, if I could uh, give my perspective on that. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm a dreamer. I always have dreams, and I think this is the reason why I am successful. So I would rephrase your question into what kind of dreams I had and I still have for Russian science. For Russian science to reach that stage of perfection which uh, it had once had. Uh, there were three dreams that came true. Uh, three dreams of mine for Russian science and one more that remains to, be, uh, to come true. So many years ago, like eight years ago, uh, when when, when uh, I was uh, interviewed, uh, I said, uh, you know, I am dreaming about creation of an institute in Russia which would operate in English, which would bring the best talent from all over the world, which would be small, elite, and operating on a different, more international system. And which would bring all the best people, no matter Russian or not, or Russian speakers or not. I just said it, I just said it to a journalist. It was published in a newspaper and a couple of years passed. And then I read in a newspaper that such an institute is created. Okay, I applied for a professorship there. I was already a professor in the States and this is an institute of my dreams. Exactly what I said in the interview, except one thing. I wanted it to be in the south of Russia because I am from south. <laughs> uh, but, but it's created, unfortunately, in Moscow with uh, all the rain and uh, bad weather. But uh, it's all the same. I apply. And eventually, I, I'm a professor there. Second thing, um, my students from China, most of my students were, in, when I was in the States, most of my students were Chinese. 
and they told me about a program for bringing global talents in science to China, the so-called Thousand Talents Professorship Program. Um, and I thought, why Russia doesn't have it? And then comes Mega Grants Program, which is the same kind of program as Chinese Thousand Talents, but actually brought to perfection. It's a more intelligent program, in my opinion. And my third dream was, uh, so after I moved to Russia, now I spent majority of my time in Russia, and uh, after I moved to Russia, I saw many talented young people. My postdocs are great. One of my postdocs recently uh, got a professorship in Germany. Another of my postdocs, uh, she, she is uh, Mexican. Another uh, postdoc of mine returned to China and became a professor in a famous university here in China. So, but I thought, why, why doesn't the government create opportunities for young, talented people inside the country? So a young, bright scientist who publishes good papers, why doesn't he get a chance to form his own laboratory when he's 25, 26? And I was running around with this idea, and whenever I was interviewed, I said, this is what Russia sh should do. And OK, half a year ago, I again open a newspaper. I don't open newspapers often these days, but uh, when I open, often it comes with a surprise. And I say, OK, Russian government created a program uh, to enable young scientists to create their own laboratories. And I think it's just wonderful. It's the best way to retain young talent, and in fact, even to bring, um, bring young talent from outside. And now I have one more dream. Just one more dream, and I think with that dream, uh, I should, <laughs> with that uh, dream coming true, I think I could safely say that I will have no more dreams, uh, global ones, only dreams for myself. Um, my final dream is uh, to see the time when Russia will start importing top-level scientists, not by tens or hundreds, but by thousands. I want Russia to be. Um, a global, large-scale magnet of talents. The way America is, the way China is becoming, the way, to a large extent, Europe is. I want Russia to be the biggest of them. Martin, you should open newspapers more often. Maybe dreams will come true. Yeah. No, these days I prefer, not to, these days I prefer yeah. not to open newspapers no, and TV I, at all. They, they are enabling your dreams. I think it was mentioned now, it's enough. It is scientific American is participating. <laughs> um, before I see, there are two other questions here which I want to come to, but I thought, Anton, do you have requests of the scientists from the practical side? Are there things that they can be doing for companies like yours? Uh, well, not only for companies like ours, but actually we are at World Economic Forum events, and the main topic of this year is Fourth Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm which is obviously driven by IT. And IT, as I said previously, is based on mathematics. It's all about that. It's all about science, but it's more practical application of science. So, and here, even though I agree with Mr. Fursinka, Russia is not the biggest economics now, but in terms of human capital, in terms of potential, uh, it can be surprisingly be one of the drivers of this fourth industrial revolution, just because of people. I'll, just one example. Uh, Every year, uh, there is an organization called Rospatent, which is kind of Russian patent bureau, uh, publishes uh, 100 best um, inventions, best patents. Our company in this year, uh, a work has got 15 of them. Again, uh, this is all about uh, the way uh, mathematicians and IT engineers work. They always try to create something new. There is natural spirit of curiosity. This is all because uh, thanks to all these gentlemen who's been raising, raising uh, people for our company. And uh, this is pretty interesting that uh, uh, despite of different uh, sums of money invested in the science compared with other countries, uh, Russian scientists, Russian software engineers are so much visible. I'm pretty sure everybody has heard about very scary Russian hackers. This is the dark side of brilliant Russian education. <laughs> uh, everything has got dark and bright side. And one more thing I wanted to add here. Um, once I was talking to one of my colleagues from software company, and he, he's a software developer, a mathematician, essentially. And uh, he mentioned one really interesting thing. Uh, so we were talking why software engineers are the best. And he said uh, there is one thing which Russian scientists has. It's called smikalka. And I'm really curious how it can be translated in English. Maybe you can help here. So it's kind of 
smart creativeness. Smart uh, exactly. So maybe the, some speculative uh, 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 approach and, for the and adventurers too. Uh, in a good way. Yeah. It's really it's really hard to find direct translation for this word. It's kind of how you think, how you solve problems, how you solve it in a very positive, smart, and unusual way. This is cool. We love it. That's cool. Um, so I saw one waiting back here very patiently. So I have the highest regards for the long tradition of excellent mathematics and natural science in Russia and by Russian scientists. But life science is much less developed. Why is that? Has that been a priority and what is to be expected for the future? What about the life sciences? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Вы знаете, все очень консервативные, российские ученые немногим лучше остальных. И поэтому мы очень держались за тот центр превосходства за физику. And so our centers of excellence were always related to mathematics, to physics. Проблема качества жизни. And maybe paying slightly less attention to the quality of life. Сегодня ситуация немножко поменялась и в организационном плане. Мы сделали несколько шагов. So, um, organizationally, we have changed uh, the structure. Uh, academically, we have changed. We have um, organizationally restructured the Russian на, Academy of Science. Uh, First, different institutions were targeting different uh, areas. Some of them agriculture, some of them medicine. Some physics and mathematics and chemistry. On the other hand, today, more attention is paid also from the financial perspective. And the interest is paid to these, this kind of research to life science. I'm not talking only about medicine, but also such an important sector as agriculture. И это привело к тому, что наши ведущие ученые в области физики, в области математики, начали, особенно молодые ученые, начали сдвигаться в эту сторону. Мы оцениваем количество грантов, на которые претендуют молодые ученые, которые говорят о том, рост количество запросов именно на пограничные we have more requests for multidisciplinary research от нетрадиционно занимающихся этим направлением ученых so away from traditionally traditional areas but more into the convergence of areas единственный шанс это если Артем напишет в газете, тогда это произойдет быстрее. If Artem reads about it in the newspaper, it will of course happen faster. Если он не напишет, то это тоже произойдет, хотя чуть медленнее. But if he doesn't, then it will still happen, but maybe not so fast. Could I just ask one follow-up on the restructuring of the universities? Can you tell us a little bit more about how you're doing that? Are you fostering a multidisciplinarity more in the ways that Valerie was describing? Знаете, вообще управление наукой это очень сложный процесс. You know, managing science is a very complex process. И приказами там вряд ли чего-то можно добиться. And by just ordering something, you can achieve. Я по профессии. Not so much. Занимался. By profession. Когда занимался наукой, занимался газ динамикой. When I was a scientist, I used to be into gas dynamics. Знаете, есть система управления, когда слышишь перепад давления. So there is a system where you see the drop uh, of pressure. Uh, and so the gas or the water would flow in a different direction. So I think uh, there is something similar in how you could influence the situation in science. So the direct management is not always the most efficient. В, мы создали целый э, комплекс программ But we have для университетов, а сейчас и для академических институтов. Мотивируя э, 
and we're motivating them by offering more interesting tasks to them in those areas where around the world today are considered to be the most advanced, most interesting. Not just for the Russian science and the Russian economy, but globally. For example, I can say again, what's really important for the world and for Russia is agriculture, because today the right products, it's your health. It's the future, it's, it's the medicine, and it's the future of the world, because we know that in the world there are many people who are obese, and the world is getting fatter because they eat poorly, poorly in a, in a sense that they eat wrong food, and some don't have enough to eat. So this is one of the most important sectors. Uh, both for the science and Мы, just for our global future. Uh, so we offer new tasks, I mean the government, and we finance these new tasks, and maybe we finance them better than the traditional areas. So young, dynamic, ambitious people are moving that way. We put these tasks in front of the people who are not into agriculture, but who are mathematicians. And this shift is gradually felt. This is a long story. This is a story, unless there is an article uh, that uh, Professor Aganov reads. But we see that it's, it's changing slowly. There is a shift. And for colleagues who work in Russia, who move into Russia temporarily or permanently, they are from these fields and they have experience in working in other countries on these uh, dimensions. So that's very important. Thank you. He's been waiting patiently and then over to you. Thank you. I'm a microbiology teaching these courses at Tsinghua University in Beijing. So, uh, in the earlier time, Russian general microbiology was almost the strongest in the world. They contribute a lot to general microbiology. But now, uh, when I go through uh, almost all the journals in microbiology, you hardly see any papers from Russia. So, I'm going to visit Russia in September this year. So uh, I try to dig out uh, the Russian, Russian microbiology development. I could not find many. So I assume that some of these papers are published in Russian domestic journal, whatever. So I just wonder if there are any sources that we can find Russian microbiology research in Russia. And maybe not in English, but in, uh, in a local language. Oh. I can just very quickly comment on general, I think. Uh, experimental sciences suffered the most during the, uh, uh, in the beginning of the changes, uh, especially in the 90s and the beginning of 2000, because theoretical science has been supported and throughout the toughest times, and it's a little different in the way it is executed as opposed to the true laboratory research. So the fact that you are not seeing papers is probably reflective of the fact that there is much lower output indeed. It's not, it's not out, and people do publish in life sciences. I think it relates to the question about life sciences in general, too. But uh, you can do if you uh, believe the graphs and you can actually track what was published, how much, and how much uh, it was used. Uh, it's simply a result of the difficulty, and if I can be brutally honest, it's a lost generation of scientists which we need to rec recreate right now. And I think that's one of the most important tasks of us as the international community is to capitalize on what's there, but in reality, we need to start from scratch. We need to create that generation, and it's going to be a 10-year turnaround. It's not a three-year, five-year process. It's a generational process. So we need to grow that new generation of scientists, and we need to 
but it means using resources, so you know, gold resources and importing talent, that's perfectly fine, but it needs to be done with them as well. So, and I think it would change. I doubt very much that when you go to Russia in September, you will be able to see some only in Russian published journals and never translated. I don't think that's the case. I think there is indeed lowered output. It's, in, it's changing now. It's increasing dramatically, but it's not where it should be. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like a combination of incentives and then focus for a period of time so the Correct. researchers know they can rely on it yes. and will continue to focus on time. it. It's demand some time. It's uh, even for the chairs, it's uh, nine months. You see, mm -hmm. for the something for the articles, it's uh, demand a little more. Well, we need to have a child and actually educate and bring him or her up as well. So that's that takes time too. If I can add just an example of lost generation, I come actually from the family of scientists. My father has PhD in chemistry. Uh, mother is more, was working in chemistry. Uncles and their friends of friends. So actually, all my childhood, I was born with the, guy, uh, with the people who are scientists. And out of, I don't know, a few dozens of them, only a couple of steel in science. So this is an example for you. You've been very patient. Um, um, so two, two short questions. The first is, how do political, um, geopolitical tensions, um, like between Russia and Ukraine, between Russia and the Obama administration, or periods of uh, geopolitical honeymoons between the current U.S. administration and Russia, how did that impact um, the exchange of scientists or the funding of projects? Um, that's the first sort of question. The second, we heard a lot about the mega, the mega um, trends project. Could you just mega grant. Uh, mega, mega, mega grant? grant sorry, mega grant. Mm -hmm. Could you just tell us what it is about? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a Would you like to start with the? Geopolitical situation? Or? Uh, no, let's go to the Okay, so I will not uh, delegate responsibility. I can take this question myself. You know, um, when we talk about science and how geopolitics is influenced, that it is a very weak link, very little influence. As my colleagues have said, we have participated in collaborative that, research uh, even more during uh, more difficult times in the past. Moments, we understand they, that uh, 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 the, the political situation should not really influence those things, but instead they should compensate for those yeah. things. Um, the bond between scientists must remain strong. And I can say that from the Russian side, there are no restrictions. We do not create problems for that. We understand that for some of our colleagues abroad, there could be some problems. Psychological, organizational. But at the same time, we're trying to create a situation in which they would be free from something like that when there is no situation that they are involved in geopolitics somehow. And I think we're succeeding. I think it works out. As for the mega grants, maybe the beneficiaries of the mega grants could talk to that because both of them have participated in the program. What I can say is that just maybe one thing that the resources have been allocated and so there was a decision to uh, fund the science during the first crisis, economic crisis of 2008, where the overall situation has worsened. But the decision was that we're still going to use this big money. It was a big amount, especially by the Russian standard. But we still decided to go ahead with it and to pursue this goal. So that shows a certain will uh, from the government to keep developing these processes so that they could change the landscape of Russian and global science. And maybe in more details, uh, my colleagues will talk about this. You know, I will start actually by a very brief answer to the first question, a comment. Uh, in my observation, 
the vast majority of scientists are actually opportunistic, opportunity driven. Uh, people can talk about uh, political issues and tensions and so on, but when there is an opportunity to create your own laboratory, people go to China, although China has a one-party system and people in the West don't like it, but people from the West gladly come to China to create their own laboratories. People may uh, take one side or another in the tensions between Russia and the US, but when there is an opportunity to create a laboratory, a first-class laboratory in Russia, I think nobody will decline this opportunity. So these mega grants actually are very attractive. Uh, my interpretation of this mega grant pro program is that it's a pilot program to, well, you know better, but I think uh, the program, it attracts only 40 people per year, only 40 people per year, but it already attracted a uh, few Nobel uh, laureates and really top-level top people, many of whom have absolutely nothing to do with Russia. And even in these times of geopolitical tensions, of horrible media campaign against Russia, I think, I don't know how anyone can believe that uh, stuff that Russia is uh, guilty of, uh, you know, sunsets and cold weather in Canada <laughs> and Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, Russia is guilty of all of that, of course. Uh, and when American people elect their president, it's also somehow a Russian result. Uh, I, I don't know how people with non-zero IQ can take all of that uh, seriously. And actually, that could be a magnet of people towards Russia as well. I think people have an inna innate sense of fairness. If somebody is accused of everything, uh, people might actually accidentally take that side. But regardless of that, I think uh, scientists largely uh, are opportunity driven and apolitical, I think. And um, uh, politics should not really be part of the equation here at all. I think it's good that people are opportunity driven. So mega grants are that opportunity uh, for people to create a world class laboratory in Russia, taking advantage of large resources that this program gives, taking advantage of uh, talents, really phenomenal talents that Russian uh, young scientists are. Um, for me, for me there was a guiding principle for many, many years. You know, I lived more than 16 years outside of Russia. And I asked myself, why am, am I doing it? Why, hmm? yeah. Where in Britain, where I did my PhD in Switzerland, where I was a group leader, and in America where I still actually am a professor. Uh, more than 16 years, and I asked myself, why? What am I doing here? And the answer was the following. Whenever you can work at home and not at home with all the others equal, uh, choose home. So if home gives an opportunity, take it. And mega grants were that opportunity. And it was, uh, you know, I had to spend four, year, four, four, four months per year. This is enough to feel the atmosphere, to feel if the country is suitable for living, suitable for working. And I took the chance to try, and I thought, it's wonderful. And after that, I relocated to Russia. I think it's an opportunity to sum up for global leaders of science to create laboratory in Russia, uh, taking advantage of all the uh, resources and talents that it provides, and it's an opportunity for Russians who left to try if they can be interested to come back. I think it's wonderful. Maybe a short remark. Go ahead. Uh, you see, I, as you remember, I began from the um, from the idea that uh, we need some intellectual diversity and we need some center of the excellence with a different environment. In uh, Russia, we have a little other environment in the science, a little other approach, and this approach was really very productive for the for the other part of the, for the other world. And because of it, maybe, it's important if that uh, some uh, excellent uh, scientist, not only Russian, but the other one, time to time work in Russia. Because it's the other approach, maybe more wide, maybe not so practical. But uh, the exchange in the Russia, uh, at least earlier, and I think now also, more free. You see, it's not so pragmatic. And because of it, I think it's also important, because it's the other spirit. Yes. Thank you. I, I see there are other questions in the room, but I, I, I know we only have a couple more minutes. 
I, I think it would be helpful for everybody. We've talked about a lot of things here. We've talked about, um, many, in many ways, the progress of Russia, which has been quite wonderful. So I, I loved hearing about the, the dreams that got answered every time. And, and as a journalist, I'm happy you were looking in newspapers. Thank you for, <laughs> for looking, um, you know, for, for fostering, um, you know, creation of, of, of ways to support talents, global talents in Russia, to support uh, young scientists on their journeys. It's hard enough to get started in science. It seems like a really a wonderful thing. Um, and, and ways that uh, we celebrate through best inventions and so on, the achievements of, of science and technology, and that um, maybe you can't order change, but you can influence it by focusing investment and you know, uh, steady, you know, a steady thing you can rely on uh, for, for science in Russia. I thought it was quite useful, and also the idea that in the face of geopolitical change, you know, the the benefits of science um, can can only still come through like a steady support of it. I loved hearing all of those things, and uh, I loved hearing the idea that um, you know, if home offers you an opportunity, you may as well take it. I would like to give to the speakers um, with a, quickly, if you can, a sentence or two. What's one thing you would like everybody in the room to take away from? about science and the continuing evolution of science and, and technology in Russia. Would you, would you like to start us off, Anton? What's one thing you'd like people to take away from, from this conversation today about science and technology in Russia? Mm -hmm. I need one more minute. Okay. <laughs> I loved your story, by the way, that you come from a family of scientists. I wonder, you know, on it was, it was, uh, And I know that it was personal well, if I can say tragedy for my father, he wanted to be a scientist all his life. Unfortunately, he couldn't because I have a brother and a sister, so yeah. he, had to, he had to quit his laboratory. And by the way, he ended up in IT. Also uh, for me, the most uh, uh, important thing is the transformation of Russia from a barren land in terms of science to the land of opportunities. And I think we are now living through this time when Russia is becoming a land of opportunities for scientists who want to um, relocate to Russia or return to Russia. And I believe that these opportunities will grow exponentially. I'll comment on one responsibility of scientists uh, in Russia and elsewhere. And I think it's, uh, we need to be pragmatic about what can be accomplished in different countries. We need to take advantage of what different countries offer and take advantage in a good way. So it's, I'm not saying in a way to exploit, but again, there is a positive connotation to the world, uh, to the word exploit and take advantage of Russia, Russian science, uh, and how it integrates into the overall global scientific community and what output uh, it gives. And I think one of the most important things that scientists needs to be, uh, need to be able to do with your help is to deliver the message to the general public to communicate what scientists are doing because the sentiment, even though we touched on it yesterday in the United States, for example, for biomedical research is pretty strong, everybody wants to do it, but as soon as it comes to paying for that, it becomes a whole different story and uh, it becomes a very different uh, sentiment of the public, of the general public as well. And I think as scientists, as practicing scientists in academia and industry, it doesn't really matter where. I don't think those borders should, ex should exist. We need to be able to com communicate why we do it, what we do, and what it means really to be a scientist at large in today's world. So to communicate better. Um, uh, Мне кажется, что сегодня мы видим, что мир очень сильно меняется. We see that today the world is changing really. Перед человечеством стоят большие вызовы. And now humanity is facing grand challenges. О чем сейчас много говорят. Many people talk about it these days. Вызовы таковы, что в рамках существующей парадигмы на них не ответить. These challenges are that are such that in the existing system we cannot really respond to them. The response could only be intellectual. It should be found uh, in the new ideas. So we talked about this word in Russian, smikalka. Ability to find uh, the solutions 
unorthodox solutions to things. Yeah, сегодня, сегодня it's, it's the part of being a scientist. Right now, the document, strategy for the Russian science, and we have prepared this document recently. This is the strategy of responding to grand challenges uh, that the country is facing значит, and the world is facing. It doesn't mean that we have to respond to today's challenges only. We have to завтра. think about tomorrow, about the day after tomorrow. And we have to get ready as a humanity. Maybe it sounds too pompous, but uh, this is true. И поэтому, и я думаю, что and мы so вместе, и российская наука важная часть этого процесса, она, э, мы можем эти ответы найти. Together we can find uh, the answers to those questions. Thank you. That seems like an excellent, really excellent way to conclude our conversation. The world is facing grand challenges. The world needs science. And science needs the world, too. Um, and I know we'll have an excellent home for science in Russia as we continue. So thank you very much. Thanks for giving join us. You know. Thank you for the audience. Thank you.